it's uh we're as you know we're doing this uh tonight uh both from Southwark and in, in the Cottons building and of course online. Um, let me just make a couple of points. Uh, unfortunately, um, Jane Siddell is not very well and won't be with us tonight. And that's a great pity because you can't hear me. Oh, oh sorry. Oh. <laughs> Thank you very much. Is that any better? Okay. Well, okay. Okay, well, <laughs> welcome everybody again. Um, welcome to the joint meeting tonight. It's, it's one of the series that Jane Siddell has organized uh, for the last few years, uh, which brings together both LAMAS and its uh, regular lecture meetings uh, and also uh, yourselves. So um, I think as a bringing together a prehistoric society with LAMAS is a, a really good thing. Uh, we very much in, have enjoyed them, uh, getting the two audiences, as it were, together, even doing it online, as we've been doing over the last few years. And of course, we've, we've uh, got a site tonight which uh, actually involves London um, as, an, well, as an archaeological site, uh, and of course, we'll be looking at the later prehistoric period uh, in the area just north of the city. Um, I'm going to say also at, at this stage that we uh, are very grateful to to Sifa. Uh, is, is Chris here? here? Would you like to come and say a little bit about Sifa, Chris? Of course, yes. Okay, Chris is going to say a little bit about Sifa and its role in London. Uh, and uh, before she does, can I just thank you for making sure that we had these premises to meet tonight. So would you like to say a couple of words and then I'll get Andy started, okay? <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I'll keep it short. Uh, welcome everybody. Uh, I'm so pleased that you're all here. Uh, this sort of came about because CIFA London Area Group decided to piggyback on the success of the LAMAS and Prehistoric Society lecture. We saw it and thought, I'd like to get in on that. So we're very pleased to be here and I'm glad you could all join us. Uh, the Chartered Institute for Archaeologists is kind of a regulatory body for the area. Um, of archaeology and archaeological practice and the London Area Group encompasses all of that for, you guessed it, the London area. So we're, we're quite excited to hear about this excavation um, within the region. So okay. that's all we've got. Thank you so much. So, thank you very much, Chris. Where, where I'm standing tonight, I'm looking out immediately over the Thames, just uh, down river from London Bridge. And it does remind me, of course, that um, over the last 20, 30 years, uh, uh, quite an amount of evidence for prehistoric activity has come from excavations. Uh, quite surprisingly, um, it was found on sites uh, close to the river that there were quite a lot of uh, ard markings. So there were obviously fields in the area, sometime probably in the Neolithic, maybe into the early Bronze Age and beyond. And most of that site, most of those sites have been partly affected by erosion from the river and then deposition from the river. But it's uh, again very interesting tonight that we're going to be looking at the site of Principal Place, which is north of the city, uh, very close to where there's a, a lot of evidence for activity from the Roman period onwards. But also we're looking at lands which are probably slightly higher and drier and certainly farther from the Thames uh, than the ones that have previously been found in, both in Southwark and also, of course, across the river uh, on the city's riverbanks. So it's a great pleasure for me now to introduce Andy Dakin, who's going to be talking about the work there uh, and uh, on Principal Place. Uh, and Andy, can I hand over to you, yeah, please? Yeah, fine. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, right, so thanks for coming. I'll just get straight into it. So Principal Place uh, was excavated between uh, 2011 and 2016 over three phases. So, oh, it's not paging down. Sorry, just do that one, yeah. Okay, sorry about that. 
So um, what we're going to talk about is mainly uh, prehistoric remains um, and the Roman cemetery. Um, but we'll also, if we get time, talk about medieval and post-medieval remains, 17th, 18th century street frontages and the 19th century gas books. Okay, so the site is uh, located um, to the west of Shoreditch High Street. So if you imagine uh, sort of five minutes from Liverpool Street uh, walking, so, and it was divided into two areas by the developer, which is basically the commercial site, which is now Amazon headquarters, and a residential site, which is a Norman Foster tower block and um, some unaffordable, affordable housing. So, okay, so this is the, the, the more or less the state of the site prior to the excavations. So what you have is on, on the west side, um, next to Norton, on the, on the east side, next to Norton Folgate, it's completely truncated by the line out of Liverpool Street, but all the other areas are actually, um, there's a lot of survival. So all those yellow areas that you see are really good survival because there's only a coal yard and a viaduct. And although the viaduct cuts away all the stuff in the actual places where the footings of the viaduct are in between, the sequence is completely preserved. So we've got a whole sequence basically from the 19th century down to the Roman and prehistoric. Okay, so before the site started, uh, we did a standing building survey on some of the buildings and the railway infrastructure. Okay, so if we start with the prehistoric remains, the prehistoric remains were confined to the northern extent of the site, east of the Wall Wallbrook. So basically a Wallbrook stream um, divides the site in half. So we're in the uh, shallow, shallow basin that's drained by streams and the prehistoric remains were in the north end of the site, about 15 meters east of where the Wallbrook stream is. Okay, so here's a prehistoric stratigraphy, which was basically four Neolithic pits and um, a load of stake holes driven into brick earth. And there was also some residual Neolithic pottery um, within a Roman cremation that was on the site. So in the stake holes, there wasn't a lot. There's some odd bits of flint, but it is um, signs of perhaps some sort of temporary occupation of the site. Um, uh, so move on to the next one. Right, so this shows in more detail the Neolithic pits that we had. So those four Neolithic pits on the right hand side, uh, 146 sherds, 45 sherds, 31 sherds and 76 sherds. So 348 sherds of Neolithic pottery from an estimated 28 vessels were retrieved if you include the uh, Roman cremation burial, which had 50 sherds in. So that's masses more than any other site in and around the city of London. I think uh, Gresham Street had about 25 or something sherds. So it's a, it was an unexpected surprise basically, because we were mainly looking at the Roman stratigraphy in that area. So first we thought they might be cremations, but uh, not so. The other thing about the sherds is there's a lot of cross sherds between individual pits. So pits from the same, um, sherds from the same vessel might be in more than one pit. And certainly there are some cross sherds from the Neolithic vessels in the Roman cremation. So, so if we just uh, look at a quick illustration of some of the pottery. So the pottery was largely medium to large round base bowls, uh, which John Cotton's described as having some Peterborough ware traits. So if you look at this one at the top, P1, a deep bag shaped bowl with, you can see the finger impressions at the top, and then an open bowl at the, and a thick wall bowl at the bottom. And you can see also the rim has been uh, shaped with uh, finger impressions. You see this much more clearly on the actual photograph. So nice sort of flint temper pottery and you can see all the finger impressions across the top. So if we go to the second uh, figure, 
P4 thin walled S shaped profile decorated open bowl and um, P5 thin walled open bowl and then two more open bowls at the bottom. But you can see that the top one is quite a bit of decoration on it, which uh, if we switch to the photo shows it much better. Um, so you've got these what's called angled stab and drag decorations and horizontal and vertical tool lines. So um, John um, Cotton immediately identified this uh, as Neolithic when he saw it. So, and then the top one here, P9, this was an interesting bowl because it had an animal bone impression on it. So we got the animal bone specialist to look at it and they think it might be a deer hoof of a deer neonate, but it could be, um, I think it could be a, a sheep hoof or something like that. So, and then you've got, again, you've got these fin walled bowls and a fin walled bowl at the bottom of a beaded rim. And then uh, we 100% sampled all of the four pits. So in this process, we've got 200 pieces of struck flint from the four pits, basically. So you can see a mixture of scrapers, flakes, axe edges. So um, John has described this in, in his report as water from water rounded cobbles and bulleted bullhead bed flint, which he thinks is all lo mostly locally sourced. Although he thinks some of the um, flint axes may be uh, from further afield. So if we just, um, total up, PIP 5375 had 120 flints, including an end scraper, a micro denticulate, and a utilized fake. And PIP 5422 had 62 flints, including a core tablet, a polished axe fragment, an end scraper, micro denticulates, and a utilized fake. And PIP 5371 had 15 flints, including three polished axe flakes. And then the last pin just had three flints. So it's quite a bit of variation from in the amount of flint within the various pits. So what we did is we had a um, lipid survey done on the, uh, I think it's 32 sherds from 16 uh, vessels. And the results came up with uh, ruminant dairy fats, i.e. milk, butter, and cheese being processed, um, what they call rumen and antipose body fats from sheep and cattle. So they're cooking sheep and cattle and um, a little bit of a much less non ruminant and antipose fat from pig probably. So um, these results were sent in from the University of Bristol. So in summary, the University of Bristol said the lip lipid recovery rate was extremely high from these vessels. So equivalent to most of uh, other stuff from uh, England and Wales. So, and they found evidence for sustained use for processing animal products, including burnt residues. They found that two vessels were used solely to process, process dairy products, and that 64% of the vessels are used mainly to process dairy products. Three vessels were used to process carcass, and four vessels were used to protest, protest ruminant and non-ruminant carcass products. So it gives us a good insight into the fact that they're farming in the local area and a, a heavily sort of dairy-based diet and uh, for um, diet on ruminants like uh, sheep and cattle. So the University of Bristol has um, developed what's called by um, John Cotton in his report as a game changer in that they were able to date the fats from the vessels. So this means that they can tie in the um, shape of vessel and the stuff in the vessels with a definite date. So for PIP 5375, they came back with a date of 3635 to 3380, Cal BC 95% confidence. So, and PIP 5422, 
similar date, 3520 to 3360 BC with a 95% confidence. So this means that potentially on sites where you don't have like the normal carbon stuff, and charcoal and stuff like this, you could take your pottery and get a decent um, radiocarbon date from your pottery. So potentially it's a very interesting development. So. So if we look at why principal place is important in terms of the local Neolithic um, sites, if you look at the uh, red square, it shows sites where we found Neolithic pottery in and around the city of London. And you can only see five squares there. So, and by far the most pottery has come from principal place. And then if you look at the Lithics, again, over 50 pieces of Lith Lithics, there's only what about six sites that have over 50 pieces of lithics? So basically, this has um, provided a lot of information on the Neolithic period for the area. And then again, if we look at the early Neolithic Middle and Lower Thames Valley, we see that there is an increase, increasing amount of evidence for the Neolithic along the Thames all the way up from Eating Rowan course to uh, Kingsborough at the other end. So gradually we're building up a much better picture of Neolithic activity in the area. So I'm gonna move on to the Roman cemetery now. So the Roman remains comprised early first century quarrying and ditches. And this was uh, superseded by two areas of Roman and cemetery spanning the first to the fourth centuries. So here's a picture of Londinium. So principal place is slightly off the picture, but it's basically sandwiched in between Ermine Street and the Walbrook on the north side of the city. So we're talking about the uh, Northern Cemetery here. So here's a picture of a uh, principal place in context with the city of London and the Roman city. But the, if you look at principal place, we had 50 burials. Um, and it's sort of stone's throw really from Spitalfields where we had 174 burials, including uh, two sarcophagus and uh, a previous site, 201 Bishopsgate, where we had seven burials. So we probably may have lost, we've lost a proportion of the burials to the uh, railway cutting, but we've still got 50 burials, so not too bad. So this area shows all the burials were east of the Walbrook and west of Ermine Street. So, and there was two areas, uh, one area in the commercial part and one area part in the residential part. And an area, a gap in the middle, which I think is probably because it was just too marshy or boggy. There's a lot of drainage ditches in that area. So, um, so we look at the numbers for residential site, there was 13 inhumations and one cremation. And for the commercial site, there was 31 inhumations, uh, one bust and burial, which we'll talk about, and four cremations. So much more concentrated at the south end of the site, close to Spitalfields. So this is a commercial site plan. So you've got a boundary ditch at the top. And then I've just picked out a few things that we'll concentrate on. Uh, uh, some burials, which we're going to call executions at the south end, a buster burial, second century cremation, and a coin hoard. And then on the residential site, see a slightly different, all the burials um, follow the line of a big boundary ditch. But we did have uh, one decapitated skeleton and a cremation. So, and also the residential site tended to be later. So although it was circa sort of 8120 onwards, most of the burials were sort of 250 to 400. So if we look at this cremation, this is the second century cremation. So this had a um, uh, amphora over the top, which is not upturned amphora. 
and then we scanned the cremation um, bowl. And uh, as you can see, there's huge amounts of um, fairly unburnt bone, which is a bit of a surprise. And we could actually um, sex the person from the bone, which was a female, because there are lots of chunks of unburnt uh, pelvis. So, and this is a bust and burial. So anybody not familiar with bust and burials, it's basically a pit, and then you place the body on a beer, and then you allow the beer to, as it burns, to collapse into the pit, and then you cover the pit up. So I think uh, there was, um, there's fairly uncommon. There was two, some, two examples elsewhere in London. So I think in the Eastern Cemetery is two examples, and I think there's one more. So for relatively uncommon burial practice. So here is the residence site as a decapitation burial. Uh, where the skull was placed between the legs. So this is not uncommon. Some cemeteries can form up to sort of five to seven percent of the cemetery buried in this way. And we don't quite understand why this practice was carried out, but it, we don't think it's necessarily a sign that the person was, you know, persona non grata. <laughs> this one was actually a sub-adult, so it wasn't uh, even an adult burial. But unfortunately, the osteologists weren't able to tell from the uh, state of the bone whether the head was um, cut off before the, the uh, body was buried or not. So it's a bit of an open question on that one. So then we move on to what we so, um, the osteologists interpreted as free execution burials. So these were all I mean, that's a plan of them. They're all in the same area of the site. So an area of the site has been set aside for these burials. And uh, one of them was in the double burial, but only the legs survived of the fourth skeleton. So you basically have three executions. So this is one of the execution burials being excavated. And you can see the uh, viaduct wall is truncated the lower part of the body, but the upper part's intact. So this is the osteology report. So if you see the red line is a sharp force perimortem, i.e. causing death or close to death. Um, and then there's a secondary fracture on the jaw. So they think the accuracy and the cleanness of this cup, um, they've interpreted that as someone being um, not just randomly attacked, you know, they're, they're being executed. So if we look at the photograph of the jaw, you can see there's a very, very clean cut on the jaw. And then you can see um, other fractures that are formed underneath the teeth. And then second one, very similar injury. So two, two of them had very similar injuries. Got a sharp cut on the uh, jawline and then secondary fracture forming along the uh, bottom of the jaw. And there's the photograph of the cut. So you can see it's a very cut, very clean, sharp cut on the jawline. And then uh, you can see some of the fractures forming on the rest of the jaw. And then the third one, they just had cuts on the upper vertebrae. So they've indicated on their, their uh, photograph, you can see, just about see on the photograph, there's a flat surface cuts to the vertebrae. And they've interpreted um, blade injury. So they think they're sort of basically swords that have been cutting these people. Um, so just to illustrate the type of burial practices I had, this is a first century multiple burial of three people. So you can see where the viaduct again is just sliced right through, but the area outside the viaduct is perfectly okay. I think we only had uh, three multiple burials in that area of the site. So, and then um, inhumation with flexed arms and legs. This one's the late first to second century burial. And then uh, some inhumations had uh, signs of wood 
This one had wood below the skeleton, what seemed to be coffin nails. And this was sort of 180 to 300. So in all, we had 16 burials that had nails of some form. Uh, that includes the Buston burial, but certainly some of the um, burials seem to have had coffins. And then um, we only had four non-adult burials. So this is a juvenile, sort of fourth century. Um, we don't know quite why there's so few. Uh, the osteology report suggests it may be truncation, but there was a large area of um, spill fields that had uh, a fairly high concentration of neonates and children. So it may be this is just an area of the cemetery where they're not burying children. Okay, so we do now move on to the Roman coin hoard. So the Roman coin hoard consisted of 19 gold coins dated to the late fourth century. So that's unique for uh, just outside the city of London. There's only two hoards, there's one at Plantation Place, which is sort of 43 gold coins, but it's much earlier. And then we had 114 silver coins, which were also dated to the late fourth. So if we look at the plan, the hoard was buried into the top of an earlier boundary ditch um, within the cemetery area, but we think that um, it may not have been deposited till um, after 502. So it's very, very late. So it's a kind of slightly romantic tale of chaos <laughs> at the end of the Roman occupation. Someone, um, they were all, all the coins were in a very, um, small area so we think someone's got like basically a bag of coins dumped them in the cemetery intended to come back and get them later on but has never had the opportunity to come back so we're going to show you some pictures of the coins so these are the earliest ones valentinian the first so this is a coin of 364 to 375 so you see the uh, profile of valentinian the first and then you see um on the back standard, him holding a standard uh, and victory. So beautifully preserved coins. I mean, absolutely perfect. The odd sort of spot of corrosion and stuff on them, but um, these are all subject to a report that Julian uh, Basher put out in uh, Lamas. So and then uh, his son, Valentinian II, that's a coin of 388 to 395. And there were seven Valentinian II coins. So, and then you see a slightly different uh, victory spreading wings over two emperors, which is another common theme for the back of the coins. And then a coin of uh, Valens, and Valens was um, emperor at the same time. There's a lot of, uh, sort of sharing of various responsibilities and stuff. So across the different parts of the empire. So this Valens coin is 364 to 375. So it's contemporary with the sort of uh, one of Valentinian I. And then you see standard uh, uh, back of the coin there. And then you see a coin of Gratian. So Gratian was uh, Valentinian's oldest son. Um, so this one's dated sort of 383 to 388, and uh, Gratian was uh, uh, sort of superseded by Magnus Maximus, who's not part of the family, uh, he was a soldier, but uh, that, that kind of Magnus Maximus is uh, gained the same date. So you can see towards the end of the Roman occupation, there's a lot of, uh, it's a bit like succession, you know, <laughs> there's emperors all over the place and different responsibilities and sort of slightly overlapping with each other in places. And then uh, the last one is a coin of Arcadius of 383 to 388. Um, a contemporary of Arcadius said that he had rather hollow drooping eyes, uh, eyes and that he was a bit of a mental midget. So <laughs> not capable of ruling on his own, but relying on um, people to help him. And then I've just put in one example of the um, 
silver coins. The, a lot of silver coins, and all of, most all of them were clipped. So it's a sign of the devaluation of currency at the end of the Roman Empire. Or the Roman occupation rather. So, and then just a few examples of some of the pottery we found. So a Roman flagon and uh, a Roman dish. And then a rimmed beaker of the third to fourth century. A nice decoration on there. And then there's a hunt cup, which I don't know if you can make it out, but there is actually a relief of a stag on it. And then round the rim, there was a stag being chased by dogs. So we'll just move on to the um, medieval period. So I'll just see how we're getting into time. Um, so in the medieval period, we didn't really find much activity in the medieval period. Uh, so if you look at the diagram, we have St. Mary Spital um, at the bottom and Holy Wells. So these two priories, um, principal place seems to have been somewhere in the outer precincts of these two priories. And once, you, once again, you see the Walbrook stream snaking through the site. So just a couple of examples of uh, medieval ditches. This is a late medieval ditch, which was lined with timber posts. And then we found evidence for the Walbrook. Um, the ditch that seemed to be in the position of the Walbrook stream had some wattle fencing reinforcement. So it was reinforced on both sides on the alignment of the Walbrook. Okay, so we move on to the early post medieval period. So Argus map of 1560 shows the site as relatively undeveloped. I'm not quite sure to put the site outline exactly the right place. I think it's probably a little bit closer to uh, Shoreditch High Street. But as you can see, most of the area around is fields, although uh, it's very close to the Curtin Theatre, which is a uh, the site next door that's been excavated by Mola where there's late 17th century, I think it's uh, sort of 1570 onwards, is the Shakespeare's first theatre. So. Okay, and then we see by the late 17th century, Worship Street is shown as Hog Lane. The whole of the south side is developed as street frontage and uh, the north side remains gardens, gardener's garden. Uh, the area close to Shoreditch High Street is all developed and uh, Worship Street is shown as Hog Lane. So this, uh, we can see the remarkable state of preservation of the post-medieval stratigraphy. So these are all brick and cobbled surfaces uh, just north of Worship Street. So two lines of building either side. You see like the, the variety of um, sort of herringbone patterns, all sorts of cobbles. So sort of patchwork of um, surfaces. And then uh, this is a surface which is constructed of 17th century Dutch paving bricks. So these bricks have probably been reused, uh, but they're especially uh, uh, popular because they uh, were very hard wearing. So they're sort of narrow yellow bricks. And then we see an example of the elaborate drainage systems in the late 17th, 18th century. So lots of this kind of um, activity across the site in between the houses. And then a 17th century boundary wall. And this one has a mixture of timber, masonry and uh, brick in it. And then at the, towards the um, western end of the site, mostly gardens, we had like um, barrel wells, 
and brick wells. So these are all sort of 16th, 17th century. And then we have a, a brick cesspit. So we've got quite a lot of pottery out of these features. So we're um, on spill fields, we tried to tie in the results from in individual cesspits into uh, individual properties. So I hope we may be able to do something similar with some of these properties. And then you see uh, brick drainage. So some interesting patterns. This one's a kind of almost a heart shape type triangle shape drain. So in the early 19th century, the site was turned into a gas works. So this is one of the first gas works in London. There was one uh, up towards Pall Mall before it, but this one dates from like 1813 to 1872. Um, this shows the demolition of the gas works in 1872. So nice picture of uh, early health and safety there with a sort of crash mat with people with not very much on underneath. But this uh, gas works run by the Gaslight and Coke Company, uh, mainly for gaslighting at this stage. So it was at the cutting edge of the technology. So if you see Stanford's map, it calls it the old charred gas works um, in 1862, just before it um, goes out of business. So you can see the uh, gas holders, gas buildings. So the gas works was started by a um, famous German chemist called Frederick Acume, who came over to Britain to sort of fly his trade and make his fortune. And then it was completed by Samuel Clegg. Um, Samuel Clegg uh, patented quite a lot of gas works processes, including uh, purifying the gas, gas by um, passing it through lime. And here is a early cartoon of 1813 showing a sort of degree of skepticism. Um, he sort of says things like, what a stink, he's gonna blow us all to hell and all this sort of thing. So, <laughs> and this appears to depict Frederick Acum holding a sort of test tube Bunsen burner or something and blowing up the whole of uh, East London. So <laughs> here's a picture of uh, from above of the excavation. So you see at the bottom of the picture, we've got a gasworks chimney. Then we've got the retort area, um, various flues and drains leading off to uh, brick tanks, which uh, some of these brick tanks were filled with lime. And then here's a close up of the chimney base. So quite a sizable chimney base. This is probably one of the best preserved gas works that's ever been excavated in London. And then you can see the uh, picture of the flu, um, especially um, Fireproof bricks were used in the flu, which uh, were imported from Newcastle on Tyne. And some of them still had the mark on them for cow and fire bricks. So they're especially uh, produced for operations like this. And then there's a timber base of a building adjacent to Curtin Road. So I think this is some sort of storage of a building or something receiving stuff in. And then more excavation of brick tanks going towards the north end of the site. So some quite nice um, uh, brick patterns and things in these, even though they're for industrial purposes, they still spent quite a lot of time um, making them decorative. See, so you can see the base of a brick tank here. And then here's a gas works wall looking towards Shoreditch High Street. So next to this wall, we had a big concrete base, which we think the uh, gas holders must have sat on. 
So eventually um, the gas works was sold on to the railway company, which takes us right back to the start of where we started. <laughs> so um, that's it for the talk. Right. So. Thank you very much yep. um, A very interesting talk, very interesting multi-period talk. Uh, and we've got a little time for some questions, I think. I see Chris is looking at his watch. We've got 10 minutes for questions. Okay, that's good. Um, and should I go back, do you think, to... Uh, you can go back to it. <laughs> yeah, where were we? Or I can ask a first one before handing over to Louisa. Louisa, are you ready for one? Nothing from me yet. Okay. Well, we'll come back to you in a moment. Um, can I ask the audience here if there are any questions? Chris, your hand is up. Yes, please. Yeah, yeah. Um, you mean the gas works? Because I mean, I didn't figure it was something quite new and trade rather than the spacesuits or anything. Have it been quite ridiculous before? Um, no, yeah, sorry, can you repeat the question? Oh, I'm, to be honest. I'm, I'm sorry. Do you just repeat that, Chris, and I'll get it back no, to you. No, can you repeat it for us? Okay, I will. Chris will repeat it. Thanks, Bobby. <laughs> so, do you mean the gas works? I don't know, it might mean it's a rather than just kind of a case of the case. Yeah. It's probably quite, quite unusual. So, it's quite an immediate beforehand. Well, I think, I think maybe they cleared out most of the sort of contaminating material when they took over and turned it into a railway yard because there wasn't really anything to speak of. There's some lime in places, but other than sort of coal deposits and things, there wasn't really much nasty stuff about. <laughs> Fortunately for us, really. Okay, thank you. Yes, please. Um, have you started any um, post comparison or mapping of um, Gotham Street for anybody adjacent? Um, oh, sorry, road map, um, I, I don't think the idea of the comparable site that we were looking at really at Spitalfields, but there wasn't that much. It's just odd finds, really. Um, when they, ex they we excavated the site next door, which is a stage, this is virtually, is literally adjacent. There's no prehistoric um, stuff. Okay, so Blossom Street was opposite. Yeah, I haven't. We haven't looked at that in the analysis, okay. but it may be due to, uh, yeah. you know. <laughs> and maybe because it's at a different stage of analysis yes. i'm not sure what stage yeah. that is you see because these this site we've actually fully analyzed what we've got up to publication level okay. so we may still be uh right. processing the surrounding I sites like some excavations at Street. i was going to say yeah. we perhaps could ask you a question yeah, yeah. do you have any <laughs> Which we, yeah. stuff at or yes or any similarities in the work there with i think there was some roman burials that i found yeah um, yeah. 